Couch Podcast. We're back again, Luke. We are. Two weeks in a row. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Feels it's good. Hot, yeah. um, and today we've actually got a guest. So exactly. welcome, Mitch. Hey, everyone. Hello. Welcome back. I think this is like probably your fourth round or something here. Yeah. Fifth, maybe. Yeah, I would say so. I think there was a couple of uh, what round tables and yeah, the yeah. Other bits and pieces, but yeah. Recurring visitor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome back, visitor. That's right. Yeah. So how you been, mate? Good, good. Just busy work, I think. You know, I've entered that stage of my life, and I'm sure you guys are probably in the same point where you catch up with someone, you're like, so what you been up to? Anything interesting? Like, nah, just work. Nah, and just work. Same old, same old. <laughs> same old, same old. And then, you know, occasionally it's like, oh, I think you're going on holidays soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, which, you know, probably implies we're in the daily grind, but, yeah. You know, woo, capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suppose your work's a bit different to most, though, so... You yeah, know, a little bit more going for you. But, you know, in saying that, I know what it's like to, you know, work with animals all day, every day, and it, was, it does become a grind no matter what, so... Mm. Yeah. It's definitely got... Like, I think if you're working with animals, it's always going to have, like, that underlying great... Um, you know, joy and experience and, you know, this is a really cool job and obviously feeling um, the privilege, really. Like, I know that sounds a bit... Oh, yeah, what's the... Oh, sorry. Am I good to swear or is that not a a good thing to uh, do? We usually uh, drop a few things here and yeah. there, so... Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I know it sounds like a bit of a wank to say, oh, the privilege of working with animals, but um, no, it really is. Like, you know, there's a joy and you're like, oh, what a privilege, but there's also days where you're like, man, this is a grind, like... Yeah. I don't really want to weigh another lizard today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, b- before we kind of get into what you've been tinkering around with and stuff there, we have to quickly just mention um, your success with Boigas this year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's been it's been good. I, um, I've had them go, the female, I've had that, that particular female who's a little beast. She's laid three clutches all up now. But wow. the first year I was an idiot and incubated them like python eggs. And so they were uh, thoroughly useless is probably the best way to describe <laughs> it. Um, last year I um, – this was after I spoke to more people that had kept them and bred them and someone said, oh, incubate them at 27 degrees. So yeah. um, I had an old small wine co- wine cooler, sorry, um, fridge that like I've used as a small incubator when I didn't breed as many animals and so I cracked it out again set it up, incubated that clutch at 27 um, and they were pretty quick to hatch and you know, all was good um, and then this year I just um, incubated them on a shelf in my bedroom <laughs> oh. um, nice. and they took way way longer um, but they hatched out just fine and they in fact fed a hell of a lot better than the other ones, the other ones were painful to get feeding um, Did you notice any difference in weights or anything like that with a longer incubation period? Or um, I did not, but that's because I didn't measure it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fair um, enough. And, look, it would be good data, and, you know, this probably gets into, I guess, the latter part of the conversation, yeah. but there's, you know, in the future there will be probably ways like that where, you know, average hope keepers can contribute that data, and it is important, and that's actually something I – might write down to talk about later um, about its value because there's a, they are there are examples of um, private keepers with that sort of fundamental data helping to contribute to some really interesting and useful stuff. Um, but yeah, no, I mean there, there's probably likely a um, an effect I'd say of like a lot of things that incubate fast generally hatch smaller, grow quicker, have more residual yolk, while things that are incubated cooler generally you know a bit bigger grow slower and um, generally have absorbed a lot more of that yolk. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But the other thing I did as well, which confounds this whole thing, is that I started trying to feed the babies last year when the, the last clutch hatched. I started to try and feed them at a week old going, oh, this is like after they'd had their first little sheds. Um, these guys I had no sympathy for, so I gave them three and a half weeks before I decided to feed them and they were all happy to eat straight off the bat. Not that anyone looked done well. Don't think I'm torturing animals here. I'm just... I was like, well, let's see how they go with a bit of extra hunger and I don't want to stress them out with mice. And, yeah, they all took off the bat. Like, literally, I think three of the five assist fed. um, Oh, no, four of the five assist fed. One refused to assist fed but dropped fed pretty quickly afterwards. So I just left the mouse in and came back in 15 minutes later and it ate it. So And, like, no painful or anything, just putting the mouse in and then 
it looked at it, tasted it, and was like, hmm, this is food, and then just put it in the tub and it ate away. So, yeah. That's good to go. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, other people say they have no issues, and I mean, I, it was the first time I dealt with baby boy last year, which is another thing, so. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm glad they're all going well. Hopefully they all eat and grow and do really nicely because um, they're, yeah, wonderful little species. Well, I shouldn't say little, but like, well, at this size, they're little. <laughs> yeah. So I've got kind of like a follow-up question to that. After having mm-hmm. done both ways where you've, you know, used an incubator and used the shelf and had probably arguably more success with the babies doing the shelf method, I'm assuming that you're going to just do that in the future. Um, yeah, I'd probably say so. It's also I'm, as I've sort of alluded multiple times uh, with conversations on podcasts and I guess to other people in the community, I'm really – uh, zone, well, not zoning back, but like stripping back what the amount of animals I'm breeding and things like that. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I've gotten rid of, or I'm trying to get rid of my big incubator at the moment. Um, and yeah, so, you know, if I have my small incubator going next year and I decide to breed a handful of things and they all need to be in that temperature, you know, they'll be at that temperature and the boy Gregs and, you know, things like uh, angle heads, which I generally breed, though I didn't breed this year, which was a bit of a, a nice change. Um, uh, angle heads, thick tails, stuff like that. I'll just incubate at room temp because they do fine. I actually incubated yeah. a pair of thick tail eggs in with the boy Gregs. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, let's just see how it goes. So I cracked open. I had a very large container of sphagnum moss with the boy Gregs. I just put the thick tail eggs in there. I'm like, let's see how they go. Um, and they hatched out a couple of weeks earlier, and then the boy got, all came, came out over a couple of days. Oh, as long as they didn't all hatch at the same time. Yeah. You might yeah. Know. Oh, that wasn't going to happen. Like, I was, they were very different lay times, so I knew they weren't going <laughs> to hatch at the same time. Um, I, that would have been real impressive if it did, and I would have felt real bad, but they would have yeah. been fine. The boy wouldn't have touched them. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I, the reason that I kind of asked that question about, you know, if something's working for you, why muck it up is because I'm hopefully going to be doing the maternal incubation with the greens mm. again this year just because of my sheer success that I, I was able to get with them a couple of years back now. Like, I just feel like if I was to take a clutch offer and put it in an incubator, I'm just going to butcher it. So, yeah. Well, this is the no. thing, right? Like, and, you know, and it's a really good point because I, again, chatting with, I guess, my close sort of friends in the herb hobby, a lot of us now have gone through, and you guys are the same, right? We've gone through that collection stage, like where you, you just want to have a collection of everything, you know, tick yeah. every Pokemon, grab every card, whatever analogy you want to make. Uh, get every stamp is your one, Luke. <laughs> uh, stamp collecting sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, so we're all past that. And then obviously the next stage people go to is like building enclosures and having more elaborate enclosures and making it more interesting, appealing and, you know, engaging to you. And I guess the stage after that in my mind is like the behaviours and that sort of thing like, now, I enjoy breeding for the sake of breeding and, you know, it's fun teasing out, seeing how these things go, how to improve them, what to do there. Um, and, you know, maternal incubation, I find, you know, it would be like I haven't done it. Like, well, I definitely haven't done it, but none of the animals I own have ever done it because I've never bred anything that would do that. But it would be a really enjoyable experience. Like it became a bit of a novelty for me in respects to just um, hatch things in tanks and not even worry mm-hmm. about it. Like if it hatched, it hatched. Yeah. Like I've had all manner of Oedura hatch in the tank now. Um, I've had, you know, Strophurus hatch in the tank, like multiple species of Strophurus. Uh, I've had Central Netteds hatch in the tank. Uh, it was one that I had a while back. Like, you know, it's just, I don't know, it, it's a bit of a fun, interesting quirk on top of just, again, stamp collecting, which you know, I'm very much away from. Yeah. And I'm sure you guys are the same. So, yeah, I totally feel you with yeah, the idea sure. of maternally incubating and, you know, how it's a bit more rewarding and, like, you know, if it works, it works. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. If it's broke, don't fix it. Yeah. You know, right, yeah, that's, a, that, that's the point. Is, And I know a few old school guys like that too. Like I know, you know, I've spoken to Rick for years about why he's still using vermiculite and stuff like that and he's like, why hatch geckos? He loves yeah. vermiculite. <clears throat> yeah. I'm like, well, that's a fair enough reason. Exactly. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, and specific, like particularly like just as a, I guess, an aside on that, right, like, when you're ever doing anything in volume or, um, uh, you know, you've, you've got a lot of things on the fly or a lot of different species, you kind of want the lowest common denominator that makes things easy. You know, you want, yep. you know, if you can keep an incubator at one temperature and incubate everything at that, that's what you want to do. People do that. Exactly. Like, 
on the incubate, say dragons of certain sorts and pythons or whatever, you know, they're not going to have two incubators usually, you know, unless the eggs are going to be lethal, but they'll just incubate them all at that one temp because it's yeah. less space, less thermostats, less, you know, brain space as well. Same with vermiculite. If vermiculite works for everything, might as well use it for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's only when things don't work is where we tweak them a little. So, yeah, I and if it works for Rick, you know, I I use perlite, and that's just because I think it looks prettier. But I think they both do a good job. You know, over water, I've had le- like much more issues with over water where things just don't seem to hatch or eggs explode or things die full term in the egg. And um, yeah, yeah, I think. It's just as good in some respects, but worse in others. So, it's funny, hey. Like, I mean, I've done overwater with the monitors for quite a while now, and I honestly find that when I first started doing it, I don't know what's changed, but when I first started doing it, I was getting heaps of like dead full term babies and stuff like that. Mm. And this year, touch wood, but so far I've had a hundred percent success rate, or just about. I think I've lost one or two eggs, but I think that was like super early on. Yeah. But yeah. It's really weird how it goes. Like one of my and one of the only few things I am still trying to breed reasonably so and not for any reason other than I just like them. Um and it'd be nice to actually get them into the hobby um to the right people. Um but Nephroshai. You know, there's enough of them around. There's uh, I've sent a guy down the SA, he's got a few. I know there's other people in Sydney with them, and then people up in Queensland as well. Uh and NT actually. Uh, I found out recently someone in the NT's got a pair. Um, but they're around, but they're not common, you know, yeah. and they mm. breed and lay eggs like Amy. Like I get heaps of eggs, but man, I have a shit go <laughs> incubating them. I, my first season, I had really good success. I had yeah. two males and a female and I got heaps of eggs and almost all of them hatched and I kept all those ones back and then the same pair. And then once those animals got to site maturity and then bred them, I've had the worst success every year. I seem to get a ton of eggs and they all seem to either go full term and die or just turn during incubation. And they all look good. They're all fertile. I hatched one baby this year out of like seven or eight eggs. Wow. Um, yeah. And anyway, I thought it was over water. And, I, you know, that one baby that did hatch is where I decided to do it over vermiculite. So I'll probably go back to doing over vermiculite next year for them. Fairly confident yeah. that that might be part of it. But, um, yeah. you know. It's all just sort of like guessing as well, right? Like we don't have That's large right. numbers to confirm what's actually happening, here, Happening, you know? I've heard yeah. of a few people having issues with gecko eggs and the overwater method. Mm. Yeah, so. it's, you know, it's it's certainly, I, I can't remember, someone has told me, I think maybe with stroughs or something, you get a pretty bad yes. outcome as well. Yeah, I know Rick spoke um, about it. He tried it and had... Yeah, maybe it is, Rick. Um, ...good outcome, and that's why he went back to vermiculite. Hmm. Yeah. But... I've only hatched a few geckos this year, but they were all over water as well. I think I was just too lazy to go to Bunnings to get any. <laughs> yeah, let's, I bought a. Uh, I don't know if they still do it. They probably still do, but I remember there was a point where Bunnings were trying to promo their massive bags of vermiculite. They used to have yeah. the, the yeah. huge bags. Well, not the huge. I mean, you go to a garden supply shop, something. you can buy like you know a billion liters of vermiculite for nothing. Um, but relative to Bunning standards, it wasn't just the one litre bag that, like, you get through in, like, a handful of incubation containers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I bought that, and that's where I really started turning back my, um, you know, incubating and breeding, so I just have a lot less stuff. I also actually I have a lot of viviparous species now that are breeding, so that's an easier thing as well. There's no no incubation to worry about. <laughs> yeah, that does make it yeah. easy. Which is cool, actually. I actually I had a um, desert skin clay follows in Onada have a double litter this season, which was quite cool. Oh, wow. First time I've had oh, a viviparous nice. species double litter. I know a few of the particularly Agurnia group stuff have done it in captivity, but yeah, yeah it was cool to see it in my own house because I was like, no way, there's a baby running around. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Which is really impressive because I don't feed my animals a ton, you know, because I'm not trying to breed them. So I, I really feed them sporadically in low numbers. So I was really impressed you'd get up and had a second clutch. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, don't see any of them kicking around either. So, oh, there's, they're another one where there's plenty of people with them. It's just no one's moving them on. Like, exactly. And yeah. when they do get moved on, I, I don't want to. That sounds like that classic. Oh, there's a million Glebo Palmer out there. It's just people are sitting on them. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, no, there's like quite a few in Onada, but I know the reason people don't move them on is because when they do get advertised, it's just shit kickers that go to them. Like, yeah, that's right. Know, and this is uh, the point you were making in the last podcast, Luke. 
Um, mm. I think it's extended more broadly to the hobby overall with some of these rare species. It's just that there's like pseudo demand for them. There's people talk about them going, we want them, we want them, we want them. Yep. But when it actually comes to buying them, you know, people either don't want to pay or aren't interested in actually acquiring them at that point in time. Yep. And so at least yep. there's people who get stuck with animals they don't want um, of these uncommon species. And then they just decide not to breed them or they just give them away to yeah, like people yeah. that are kind of in their close networks because it means they don't have to stuff around with shit kickers. Yeah, that happens um, quite a bit. Yeah, and uh, it's not to say anything negative about the whole situation. It's no. just the reality of like what is keeping, especially at the moment with the current economy. Yeah, um, but, and especially you know, if you've got something that takes like 90 days to hatch, you know, when they inquire mm-hmm. at it, they might be ready for it, but 90 days down the line, they're not, you know, they're not in the yeah. right situation to take the, the animal. Oh, totally. Mm-hmm. And like you hear about that with some of the, mo- like, you know, big monitor breeders. I know Rob's had that issue where a million people have said, I'll oh, put me on the waiting list for this. And then when it finally yeah. comes around to the babies, A, hatching, and then B, getting to a state where they're good to be sold, you know, it's just like crickets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, for sure. But yeah, so, but no, it'll be interesting to see. I'm keen for the Illawarra Expo. Um, I'm hopefully going to get to that one. I haven't been able to get to any of the other ones this year, but Illawarra looks like it should be fun and there should be some interesting stuff. Yeah, I like the time of year that it's at. Mm. There's just more chance of more diversity because there's more people who've got animals out. It's, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Although in saying that, I was speaking to somebody about the Hawkesbury one and, and they said that there was a really good variety of animals there. I wasn't there, but, yeah, they said there was some really good animals there apparently. So. Yeah, I know that I think there was good gecko representation. Like I definitely heard that. And there was some interesting monitor. Like I saw one of the videos that someone had uploaded and was like, look at the video I recorded at the expo. Um, and there was some Scalaris, I think. I can't remember oh, what yeah. locality they were, but there was a – Less oh Lockhart's or Cape York's or one of those northern ones. So interesting yeah. locality of Scalaris. Some interesting geckos. There was night skinks someone had up. You know, looked like there was some interesting stuff there, but just the, I guess the bits and pieces. Yeah. Yeah, standard story. All right. Well, we might as well get into the meat and potatoes of um, tonight's chat. And you kind of put like a really good topic to me that I, uh, you know, I think Sam. <laughs> Cam came on previously and kind of talked about it a bit with Frog ID. Um, Mm. But basically you wanted to kind of have a bit of a chat about how citizen science can actually really help, um, you know, people in the field such as yourself actually with data and stuff. Yeah. And I should say the whole rationale behind pitching that I do to you was that a while ago, and I can't remember what it was on. It might've been on a herb group or even like a personal page where someone was mentioning it, but, um, Oh, it's a bunch of herpers, like, you know, the ones that sort of get out and about regularly. Someone was yeah. bashing um, someone for saying, oh, you should put that on INAT. And, you know, they're like, why would I spend the time to put this on INAT? You know, it's a waste of that. It's not that interesting, blah, blah, blah. And as hopefully people will hear later on, there's a lot of value into putting, depending where it is and what it is and et cetera, et cetera, there is actually a lot of value even for common species to log them in a citizen science database. Um, and there's a lot of other beyond that, like reasons why you should contribute broadly or why you can contribute broadly to citizen science. I always find it interesting when herpers or even herb keepers to a degree, as I alluded to, you know, say they want to contribute and there's a way they can contribute. And in reality, I think, you know, I don't want to sound rude by saying this, but very rarely do we contribute. There's a few people that sort of, um, do, and that's, that's great. And I don't necessarily mean like you're a herb keeper on one side and you, do like professional work in another. I mean, like as a community um, at that sort of, I guess, and I don't mean it's negatively amateur level. Um, there's plenty of ways we can contribute and put our money where our mouth is. And actually on that, I want to do a quick shout out on putting their money where their mouth is to Josh Festuka, who at the start of the season said that he was going to put a percentage of his income from, or not income, but his earnings from selling species back into conservation and he made a donation with that percentage that he said at the start of the season so yeah well done yeah, that was cool. that was awesome. exactly you know, he really deserves kudos for that because again money where his mouth is he said he was going to do it and he did it uh, um, and you know, it's a lot more than what most people do exactly you know it was funny like i i did a survey which i never actually ended up doing anything with but it was just a fun little community survey i'm sure you guys might have seen it a few years ago 
And one of the points I made was, would you contribute to on the ground conservation efforts with like a percentage thing? And like the vast majority of people said no. When there was anonymity, <laughs> they were like, no, nah, I ain't yeah. paying my money to, you know. So but it was, I shouldn't say it was no. It was either a very small amount, like under 10% or something, um, or no. And that was like almost two thirds of people. Only a third of people said they would contribute like a 10% or more. Yeah. So, yeah. But anyway, I just want to say that to Josh because he deserves yeah, well to share that. Because it's great. Man. Definitely. 100%. Um, but yeah, so anyway, um, there's a million different ways people can contribute. Um, it's just, I guess, knowing how you can and what it actually does. So, like, even, you know, at a fundamental level, just thinking about a common species. So I did my PhD on Jackie dragons and I'm doing work now on uh, two different species of skink. So Lyris de Bougainvillei and Cyphus aquilus. This is in a professional work sense. Um, but with all of those, um, I did a lot of uh, sort of across population comparisons, which meant, you know, instead of just going to a spot where we knew they were in large numbers, I went to a lot of different populations to go find them. And there's a bit of a a trap with that in some respects because you can look at historical, you know, ALA data from however long ago um, and you go, okay, well, there's a population here and then when you rock up there, all manner of things can change. You know, one of the ones I had for a place that we knew they were quite commonly and easy to collect, um, I went back to, so we, we've collected them there in 2018, for instance. It was a well-known spot to find them. And then by 20, oh, no, sorry, 20, 2014 maybe that was, I went back in 2019, 2020, the spot had been cleared and changed in land, you know, like it had been turned into housing estate. Yeah. Um, and so these historical records, you know, that are on ALA are somewhat limited. Also, a lot of them have really poor um, accuracy data. So it was back in the day of museums where they'd hike out to, you know, the township of, well, at the time it would have been the township of Armadale, and they would have walked all around, you know, however many Ks were driven all around, grabbed everything they could find around Armadale, you know, gone, okay, this species is at Armadale, and then, you know, have a huge, like, you know, 100K, for instance, not 100K, but like a huge uncertainty in the area it was found. And so yeah. you know they're roughly in the Armadale region, but you actually have no idea where they are. Yeah. Um, and if you actually want to go out and find them for research purposes, like whether it be collecting tissue, because a big thing of, or a big aspect of research nowadays is um, genetic you know, materials, so we can do population genetics, we can discern new species, you know, a big aspect, a huge part of Australian um, herb research at the moment is um, sort of trying to tease apart um, species complexes, so things that we can look on the outset are definitely a species, or even things that look very um, superficially similar, so if you have them in hand, they're either really hard to tell apart or impossible in hand to tell apart, mm -hmm. but genetically they form really distinct um, I guess, species along with like, you know, say biogeographic boundaries or things like that. Yeah. Um, and for a lot of these species, we have really poor resolution. So people want to know rough areas where they're likely to find them and they can go out and collect tissue. And, you know, when you think about we have a thousand plus herbs in Australia uh, or species of herbs, I should say, not individuals, um, and there's a hell of a lot of areas people haven't gone to. And yes, some areas where people haven't gone to or haven't often gone to are places where hurt people love going because you get to see all the crazy stuff that, you know, I don't know. I think uh, Western Queensland, Northwestern Queensland, the Barclay has been done by about 20 billion people this year. You know, yeah. how many of them probably have taken GPS data and contributed to data science? I'm oh, sorry, to citizen science, I'd say relatively few. But we've yeah. certainly seen at least 8 billion photos of speckled browns and collect snakes and things that we don't commonly turn up. But we have had a really good rain season. We're suddenly seeing this massive influx of these individuals turning up and then obviously people going out looking for them. So there's all this additional data. And, you know, admittedly, in the case of that example there, people are going to the same general region and looking for them, even though they are range restricted, they're only going to the same sort of spot. Yeah. But the point sort of stands that, like, hurt people go to places where most other people don't and get this really interesting data. And so there's a real case to be made that you should, you know, write down, even if it's just like a field note or, again, using some of the apps we'll probably talk about and record that data because it, it really helps fill in this, you know, we want spatial scale. So we want things across all of Australia. We want it across as many species as we can. Um, you know, we want temporal, so through time. It's really important to be able to look at these things through time and get more recent records. 
because ultimately, if a again, what I sort of started this whole point on, and I know I sort of spiraled around a little here, um, but you know, people want to find these field sites. We want to know locations where we can go find these individuals. And a classic example I did in my most recent research working on Cyphos. One of the questions we want to do, and one of the things we need to do, talking about this lack of genetic material that's available, um, we're working on the different reproductive modes. And so some people might not know, but Cyphos aqualis, which is a, a little skink species in Eastern Australia, um, within the same species, and we're very confident they're the same species at the present. Um, and there's, I think, more evidence now that we've got that says they still are probably the same species, but the current evidence just they are one species. Um, we know that within this species, there's egg-laying individuals, so ones that lay an egg, ones that have like a transitional state, which is sort of between egg-laying and live birth. So it's kind of uh, the eggshell's reduced, the mother only holds it, or the mother holds it for a longer period of time, incubates externally for a shorter period of time. Um, and then a viviparous one, or well, actually there's a bit more to it than that, but there are viviparous populations which have um, very thin eggshells, so like a membrane, like you'd see on, say, a red belly being born, um, and then they they hatch out of that fully developed, so they sit in there for maybe zero zero days, like they just punch out that membrane straight away, or they yeah. might sit in there for a day or so. Anyway, where I'm going with this is that the egg-laying populations are the most poorly understood. Yeah. So the true egg layers, which are on the north coast of New South Wales, there is very little information on them. There's some historical stuff Rick Shine did on them, there's a few museum specimens that had usable DNA tissue in them, uh, or usable DNA from tissue, sorry, in them. But generally speaking, there's really limited information on them. And they're unfortunately one of the hardest ones to work on because so much of that north coast has been developed or is privately owned or, you know, in particularly the areas of suitable habitat for them. And they are habitat generalists, but they definitely on the north coast seem to like certain types of habitat. And anyway... Um, we had the luck of, in the township of Iluka, um, I was having, we were there collecting, trying to find some of these North Coast individuals, and we were trying in the reserve, and they were really hard to find in the, the nature reserve there. They are there, but they're just in lower numbers and a bit more challenging. And I had a look on INAT and noticed that uh, INAT recorded in there, had recorded heaps of them. And I ended up messaging him on INAT and being like, hi, look, I'm a researcher working on this species. I've noticed that you evidently live in the area and you found heaps of these, these lizards. Would you mind letting me know where they are? I can show you proof that we've got approval to do this work, you know, just proving I'm not some rando that just wants to go find a bunch of cyphos, not that really it's the end of the world. Um, and he said, sure, you know, it's great to be involved in this process. I've actually got most of them from my backyard. So if you want to come around and have a look in my backyard, you can come have a look. And we'd spent four days at that point looking for them in this uh, beautiful, pristine habitat, um, and, you know, we'd found, I think, two at that point. Uh, and in his backyard, we got about 15 in, I don't know, wow. 10 minutes, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, beyond, A, he helped us find, he gave us a bunch of other locations in the area where he'd found them, and, you know, we could get permission and go go looking for them there. Um, and all we found were cane toads. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so it's just one of those things that, like, Having that, and I've I've had similar conversations with other people when I've been uploading, you know, records in other places, and they go, "Wow, you upload a lot of Jackie records." You know, it's a great way to make connections with people. You know, let researchers who are interested in it um, know roughly where these animals are, and if you can, you know, give them that sort of information. And I've done the same thing with Larista; just extended a, you know, a branch to people that have put records of the Larista species we work on up, and say, "Hi, just like a bit more information of where you found these. Would you be willing to share it? I've got proof of." Um, you know, that we're doing research with an approved institute or, you know, a recognised institution. It's not just, you know, crack pottery. Um, so, yeah, it's a great way for you to be able to, as a, a herper, start interacting with people as well. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's it's a – and I know, sorry, I apologise, it's probably pretty rambly there, but it's just a great way for people to actually, A, contribute to, say, grassroots work where people are going out, getting, say, physical tissue – um, or looking at these specimens in the field, in life, and even potentially extending a branch for you to be involved in that process. And I shouldn't say that's always going to be the case because there's a lot of, um, as there is with everything, uh, bureaucracy and paperwork and approvals that need to be approved before someone can be involved in that process. Um, but it doesn't necessarily say it won't be the case. Um, so, yeah, um, that's one aspect. Um, the other aspect I sort of wanted to mention, uh, I guess, with respect to that is 
uh, on that thread I mentioned earlier where people were picking a fight about INAT and, you know, why would you upload that to INAT? Um, a really big and, I guess, important tool that's being used for a lot of, um, I guess, species predictions. So trying to figure out where species are, um, how certain species respond. And it, it applies to, you know, critically um, endangered species, for instance. So I know this method that I'm mentioning now, someone's uh, done recently on um, Capitar rock skinks um, at a really finite scale. Um, and then, you know, again, other threatened range-restricted species, it does work for them, but it also works on a, a broad landscape level. And I'll talk about a paper um, recently where someone actually used uh, INAT data along with, you know, images from Flickr and other crowdsource sites um, to look at a pretty large, um, uh, I guess, pattern that probably interests a lot of herpers. Um, but the idea being is this method's called sort of, uh, species distribution modeling or habitat suitability modeling with a few other elements. And it's got different permutations, but essentially what it means is that you take um, all the data available in a region of interest or across the whole species range of a species that you care about. So let's pretend, for instance, delicata, you know, your garden skink, you know, your common garden skink um, that people know about. Um, and so you take all the records that are available online from iNaturalist, museums, everywhere like that. You clean them all up to make sure you're not getting any rubbish ones. So, you know, again, talk about those histor historical museum records. There's ones where, you know, it's 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers away. You don't really know where they are. You just know they're roughly in that region. So you get this really fine scale look at where these animals are. Like, you know, you've got a record in this area showing they're definitely here, you know, and with these more recent things like INAT for interest, in, uh, sorry, these more recent applications like INAT for instance, um, it does a really good job. It logs your phone, it takes the spatial accuracy, it keeps cleaning it down until it gets to almost like within five meters, which is what most GPSs sort of do. And same with Frog ID, which is another one. Um, and I should go through a couple of the big ones as well, which I might quickly tack back to. I realize I haven't actually explained what INAT is or what Frog ID or any of those specifically are, but um, it gets this really fine scale spatial resolution. And so part of these models is that you don't just use all the data from say an urban center. So like if you're taking a photo of a delicata in your backyard every day, that's useful in one sense. It's yeah. not useful for um, species distribution models in most senses. And so you take a photo of, say, a delicata that you find somewhere. They're not commonly seen. You know, maybe it's like a real weird location or even, um, you know, it might be in a reserve that people don't really look at. But, you know, you take a photo of this delicata somewhere they're not commonly spoken about and that will go up and get logged into this system. And then eventually when someone does get these points, we'll add another data point. And obviously one data point isn't anything, you know, but as we have more and more people contributing and actually logging these these records, it really helps to increase the... Um, I guess, accuracy and um, quality of these models. So with a lot of these models, if you use really fine scale, sorry, really limited numbers of records, um, they end up being total bubkis. And it's not to say that they don't necessarily need more records now, but it just helps to increase that accuracy. People want to start separating. So the next stage of these models that's sort of been coming out now is that you can look at traits of interest. So something that you find really interesting, but that means you need to divide the models between those traits. And so the example in that paper I mentioned earlier was one um, that came out of Monash Uni recently on lace monitors. And so they used a whole heap of iNaturalist records along with, again, other crowdsourced records, um, photos of lace monitors between the Bells Morph and the um, uh, common standard, you know, usual lace morph. And they then built these distribution models and had to look at in sort of climate space where these animals are present because they were interested, you know, and as probably people anecdotally know, but now we've got sort of, you know, hardcore proof to it. And another interesting thing they found, which most people probably wouldn't have realised, uh, but we've now got, you know, to the west in these more arid areas where there's a lot more solar radiation and a lot more of these, you know, drier, arid things, there seems to be the, the prevalence of this um, Bell's morph. It's not to say it's exclusive, but it's definitely prevalent there. And then on the east coast, we definitely see a more high probability of the the bells morph. Oh, sorry, the the lace morph. But what is interesting is, is that their their models and categorizing um, the the lace monitors into those ecomorphs or these color morphs, I should say, basically shows that in the Hunter Valley, it seems like the bells morph is starting to come to the east coast. 
it kind of aligns with some previous genetic evidence as well that suggests that lace monitors might have come in through that or, you know, be moving through that region. Um, and the reason for that is is that it's like this dry corridor. So the, the Hunter Valley is this really significant barrier for a lot of reptiles in the East Coast yeah. because it's, you know, this historical riverbed that's dried out and now it's really arid. So particularly woodland animals just or woodland reptiles you know, generally speaking, north and south of the Hunter, if they're present, will be quite different genetically because it's been separated. Well, those those populations have been separated from, I think, some things that are like as far back as like maybe 5 million years and some a bit more recent. Oh. So like a decent degree of separation. It's the Miocene and Pleistocene. I'm not, a geo- I'm not a geological time person, but I've recently been interested in the Hunter Valley and what it means for that. So anyway, um, but they showed that, you know, there's this evidence that these morphs are kind of moving in. And so it also led into these, you know, broader sort of, I guess, evolutionary ideas about like thermal melanism. So things that are, you know, you might want to be brighter in the the arid zone because you're reflecting more heat and not absorbing heat as much and you might be more at risk of overheating. And anyway, it's just a cool example of how most people would ignore a lace monitor. You wouldn't take a photo, you wouldn't yeah. upload it to INAT. You go, that's a stupid waste of time. Mm. But... Here we go. We see an, you know, a contribution to science. And then, again, it, it really helped develop our understanding around, you know, particularly the persistence of colour in certain environments. Um, it's helped build the case that lace monitors are using this corridor or potentially, you know, using this corridor to move between, um, like it's you know, the, the sort of theory they allude to is that it, I think the Bell's morph popped up in the West and it's moved across. Mm. Um, so, yeah, anyway, it's... Um, I might be misquoting that. I think it's an open access paper, so go have a look because you can't go have a look. I haven't looked at it in a while. But, um, yeah, anyway, they highlight this this corridor and you can see it quite clearly on one of the, the pictures. Um, so, yeah, it's just one of those things where you wouldn't, most people wouldn't have taken a photo of a, a lace monitor, but it is a, a useful contribution. And, again, the more resolution you get, the more data points, the more information. And the reality is, is people are taking photos all the time, right? Like, yeah. her people are almost nuts well most people are most hurt people are nuts about taking photos you know yeah um and again like unfortunately we don't really have it in herp literature but the bird world in particular the herp herp citizen science but the bird world has this wonderful program or this wonderful um uh citizen science program called ebird some people might be aware of it but you do your sort of trip um, and you take down a bunch of extra information. So you take down like, you know, how long you spent doing it or like the effort or there's, there's metrics that you sort of include in your eBird list along with the species you found. And what this means is that you can start doing much broader comparisons because it's really hard, right? Like if, say, Jason went out to that road on the Central Coast that people love to go to to find reptiles um, and he was only there for 10 minutes and he saw nothing, he'd be like, okay, I saw nothing. Um, but then Luke, you went there for six hours and you saw millions of things. And I was yeah. like, oh, cool. Luke went there and he saw, saw millions of things. You're like, oh, yeah, we had a great night there, you know. We saw a, a million death adders, a million golden crowns, a million boiga. You know, it was a really, really good night. And I was like, oh, cool, I'll go there. And I go up there for an hour and I see one golden crown and go, this is a waste of time and go home. Um, we don't have that standardization. Well, eBird has started to move towards getting the standardization. That makes it really useful, again, in these more not necessarily with species distribution models but these broader citizen science things having this this metric this yardstick that you can go okay if someone three people were looking for six hours using a car they found this while you know one person going for one hour found this and you can sort of gauge amount, the amount of effort that people looked for so hopefully we'll move there one day but it might not be the case um and then you know things like uh just sort of alluding back to that that delicata example I did before where there's value in taking the photo of the the same delicata in your garden time and time again. Now, delicata is not a great example of that, but what is a better example is using frog ID. So frog ID has a relatively new function, which is really, really cool, where you can actually, you know, if you go to the same spot or you're, you've commonly gone to that spot and you've heard frogs there, they now have an ability for you to record an absence um, and so you go, okay, oh, cool. the frogs aren't calling, but I know that they've called here many a time before. And a big issue with a lot of particularly citizen science data, so it's not, it's got trade-offs. It's not amazing data because it lacks those things, like I said before, with sampling effort, right? 
Like you mm. can't control for the amount of effort people have used. It's usually really biased towards city centres because people take photos of things in their backyards, which is great in some respects and terrible in others. Uh, but it's usually very biased towards city centres and more particularly as well, it's usually biased to roads or well-walked tracks. Um, but um, one of the other major limitations with a lot of data is, is that it's presence only. And so what Frog ID now has with this absence is it makes it a bit stronger for making these comparisons because you can start saying, okay, on this day the frogs were calling, you know, and you can take a bunch of climate data, you can go, okay, it was raining on this day or it yeah. was 32 degrees this day or whatever. But now you can compare it to going, okay, the frogs weren't calling today because, and, you know, maybe it was 10 degrees and it's been six years of drought because that's what happens. Um, and so it gives you this ability to make these stronger comparisons. So with circumstances like that with Frog ID, you can do some really useful things by just going to the same pond, if it's your local pond or whatever, and recording it. Um, and, you know, it's it's really impressive to see and hear, particularly Frog ID, like I know a few people on the team and like my partners involved in the team, um, and some of the people that contribute that aren't herpers, they're just people that want to contribute, do a monumental amount of contributions. And that, again, is a bias in itself, but that's another issue with citizen science. But they get all this great data and they go to the same spots and it's all really good. But again, we've got all these herpers that just do so much herping, like, you know, during the, the sort of active season, they're, they're out pretty much every night if they can be. And so it's yeah. great to actually record that data out of this. And, you know, it's one of those things where as weird as it sounds and as bad as it probably sounds, it's something we don't know we'll have a purpose for, but one day someone might have a good purpose for it. It's very easy for you to collect. And it's better, especially when we want to move into the future, giving this through time data, um, it's better to start collecting it now because we might be able to see, like, there's a lot of predictions and, I don't know, people listening might be, like, anti-climate change people, but I think there's a pretty compelling case for climate change. Um, <laughs> there's pretty good evidence that we're already seeing significant range constriction, sorry, uh, range constriction happening. So the outer limits of things where they are existing at that limit of their biology or at the limit of the environment they can live in, there's evidence to suggest that things are con contracting, sorry, not constriction, contracting. Um, and just as a fun little aside, there's a really interesting paper that popped up recently that basically showed in some of these, you know, fringe range limits, some of the species are effectively, or some of the lizard species, they're effectively being born old. So their cells are already, you know, undergoing significant um, aging damage when they're born. So they're, oh, you know, yeah. the picture of the paper was these lizards are born old and then they link that to, you know, survival and things like that and showed that it's pretty compelling. That they're born old and they're dying quickly. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, yeah, there's real value in recording, you know, all this data now because it might not have a direct purpose, but it's very easy for you to collect and it's going to potentially have quite a useful purpose in the future. And again, if you see a weird species or something, something that's not commonly reported as well, it's great to rec like record that. Like shines whip snakes, you know. There's a few people that have turned those up and turned those up. They're not really commonly found, excluding you know like gas line work where you know 50 of them fall into the the pipe trail. Um, so you know if you are a herper that's desperately looking for an obscure species or something like that, and you're in the range but you're not necessarily you know. Maybe it's more limited in spots where, you know, it's the known spot for that species, like Owen Pelly's, right? Like if you're finding Owen Pelly's at the main spot, people go looking for Owen Pelly's. Still useful, but not as useful as if you find an Owen Pelly 100 k's down the road or something. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. But something we'll, we'll sort of touch on too, because I know a lot of people are probably thinking about it and maybe concerned about it, I don't know, um, is, uh, you know, if I put this information up, are people going to go take these animals? You know, if I give the GPS yeah. and put it in this public repository, are people going to take these animals? And look, that's a concern people have. It's a concern researchers have had. You know, at the worst extremes, there are people that go into the scientific literature when newly described species are, you know, presented and published, um, and they look for the GPS coordinates of the type locality and they go pillage them. Well known to happen. Um, I don't sort of think it's going to happen here to that extreme, it's usually with, um, you know, international trade stuff that isn't going to be Australian, but certainly Australian animals do get collected and shipped out as part of the international trade. And the answer to that question is there's a function in INAT that obscures them publicly. 
So if you're concerned hmm. that someone's going to go to your location, I can't remember the, I think it does it to like um, the decimal degree or something for latitude. So like maybe a hundred Ks or something. So it's going to obscure it. It's not going to be you know, clear or evident. Um, but what can happen is in those circumstances where someone's going to use the data in an approved, you know, um, method, whether it be for university research, conservation management research, anything like that, even for a government organisation, they can put requests into these organisations and get the unobscured data. So you'll always have the GPS point on your device, on your account going, this is exactly where I found it, which is really useful for you if you want to go back and try and find that animal again. So you've got the GPS mm -hmm. data, time data, all that sort of stuff. To the public, it'll be obscured. It'll just show that you found it, but it'll be a huge area where it was found. Um, and then to someone that's going to use it for a, a well-intended purpose that's, you know, gone through a vetting process. Um, and again, they'll have checks and balances, you know, like permits aren't issued willy-nilly. Generally, you have to provide a permit or proof of um, a, like an affiliation with a, an institution. Um, I know for Herp Mapper, which is a, a citizen science project that isn't really used in Australia, it is, but not to the same extent things like INAD are, uh, or is, I should say, um, Herp Mapper requires you to contact them from an approved institution and not only show that you've got a contact from an approved institution, but that you've also got an ongoing position there. So they don't want like blow-ins who have just joined that institution. So there's these additional sort of checks and balances um, hmm. for anyone that's concerned about that sort of stuff. And, you know, I generally don't care. Most of the stuff I upload is uh, pretty – and, like, I have, I think, over a 1,000 thousand things on my own that now. 90% um, of the stuff I upload isn't of interest to most people or people that want to get up to no good. Um, some things where it's private property I've been working on where I know that people probably don't want people looking around their property, I have secure out of respect for, you know, their requests. Um, but generally speaking, you know, it's not a, a huge issue to me, but I also respect other people are concerned about it. And, you know, same thing as well. People have spots. You know, they've got their, their spots that they want to keep quiet. Um, and I can respect that too because you don't want a million people going there or you don't want some dickhead who's going to trash it going there. And that happens. Yeah. You know, again, talking about our favourite spot in uh, that that Barclay region, you know, the, the Hosmer and Glebo Palmer spot that was quite, you know, maybe 18, 24 months ago, it seems like everyone goes there every three minutes now. <laughs> 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 and I'm sure there's, there's problems that come with that, like people trashing things or doing whatever. So... You know, it's it's one of those things that if you want your sit, like location or where you like to go herping quiet, you can also obscure that location so that other people aren't going to find it. Um, and in the instance, if you find a threatened species, as soon as it's identified as a threatened species, it automatically gets obscured by the program. So, for instance, I found an orchid, which I didn't realise was a critically endangered orchid, um, and then someone ID'd it as the critically endangered orchid and it just got obscured. <laughs> That's pretty cool, though, that there's actually that function in there because that's something that I've always thought about. I'm like, oh, you know, it's, it's cool to have the information, but it's also you wonder about that other side. No, totally, and that's the thing. And people, like, you know, not even for nefarious use, like exactly what I said about researchers using it to find locations for animals. Um, I know people have used it to find herping locations. They're like, wow, there's a lot of records popping up here. Why don't we go have a look out there? Mm. Um, you know, it does happen, and it's not necessarily for nefarious purposes, but if you are concerned... There is a there is a buffer, um, and it's it's a good thing to do. Like, and it's better to contribute and have that information there. Pardon me, sorry. Um, then go. Oh, I'm too concerned about it because it's easy. You just flick a button and say obscure record, and you're safe. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's a, a good thing. But you know, as I said, hurt people are going out to all corners of the earth. Like you know, they're going to all these places. They're going to remote places things that aren't often travelled, it's just a great way to get these um, spatially different, so across all these different areas of Australia and temporally different through time. So, you know, again, I'm not saying you need to take a photograph of every, you know, water skink in your backyard or every delicata in your backyard, even though I kind of made that example earlier. But, you know, if you're going out for a herp on a night, take a photo of the animal and upload it to INAT. Um, you know, spend a bit of time, maybe take a, photo, take a photo of the water skink in your backyard to get an idea of how the app works. Um but, you know, and it's been useful for me. Like, it's how I get out my collector syndrome now. Like, I'm trying to collect <laughs> them all on INAT and build my little map across Australia. Uh, <laughs> and even when you find things on roads, right, like, they're useful because, like, you know, we might not have image of eastern brown snakes in that area, you know. 
We might know that they occur on the other side of that area. We might know that they occur on, like the western side of where you're looking. We might know they occur in the north. The closest eastern record might be 100 k's. Who knows? So it's good to you know take these photos and get them sort of lodged in the system. And INAT generally has a fairly good community of people that ID the species. And now I'll come back to the fact I haven't spoken about INAT, so I'm going to get into that now, um, as in what it actually is. So it is a citizen science program. Um, but basically what it is is people upload photos of anything. And this is a great thing. If you're out herping and you're having a shit herp and you don't find anything interesting, you can take photos of interesting birds, interesting plants, weird fungi, upload anything like that to INAT, um, and generally you'll get a rough idea. People will ID it um, within error. Like sometimes, I know particularly the plant community are real mean to me for not like, not that they usually are, but, um, you know, you put up a photo and they're like, well, can't tell the species because you took a crap photo. But they'll ID it to genus and you have a rough idea. Oh, this is a trigger plant or this is a orchid or whatever the case may be. Um, so it's a great way and I find it really rewarding as well. Like if I am having a crap time herping, putting up some of these weird plants or things I find, and actually getting to know the environment you're in. Like mm. sometimes you go to the same herping spot a million times and, you know, it's just a bush or a tree or whatever. And now you're actually starting to understand the community of plants that those reptiles are living in. Like it helps you build a holistic image. And it's funny, right? Like even when people go, oh, what's this? Like send me a what's this thing. I was like, I'll put it online and see what they say. Because, you know, you start getting this feedback and it gets people in. And, you know, it's a great way to start understanding. Like, I, I did a trip down to Kosciuszko recently. I was just taking photos of all the weird little invertebrates I was finding in the Alpine region and also taking photos of the 85 billion copperheads there, you know, <laughs> like, um, so you can contribute with that. Um, but as well as helping like yourself learn, like it's really engaging space, but anyway, you take your photo. So you download the app, take a photo with it. It uploads it. It goes, do you want to ID the species? Um, you can have a guess, you're not, it's not locked in. So what I know actually does is it waits before, for a few people to actually ID it. Um, and once it gets a consistent number of IDs from people IDing it, which are crowdsourced, they're just people in the community that are really passionate naturalists, they'll ID it. Once it's got a couple of repeated instances of these records being ID'd, it'll then go, okay, this is a research grade observation. We're really confident that this species is exactly what someone has said it is. Yeah. Um, instances where you can't, people will just say to the nearest genus. So for instance, um, sometimes with brown snakes, if it's a bit hard from the photo, you can tell it's a Pseudonea species, but you can't tell based on the location. It might be a couple, like one of a couple species where they might overlap um, and you need a more diagnostic photo. Um, it just goes, okay, it's of the genus Pseudonea. And that's useful as well in some respects. Um, but you try and ID your species. If you don't have internet at the time, don't worry, just save it on your phone. It'll save it locally. And when you get back to the internet, it'll upload it. So I've got like, you know, records of INET observations in remote properties in South Australia, you know, like a couple hours or an hour and a bit west of Tipperborough. Um, so I've got records from out there where there's really been little sampling other than like some real targeted sampling at the sites I was working at. Um, well, you know, on the drive in, other places we were going, which were, you know, in that sort of the world, like tens of, well, not even tens, probably 100 k's away. Um, filling in the bits and pieces of the information around there. Um, mm. but so you, you can upload it when you get back to reception. It'll have a, a column for notes generally, so you can include notes like dead on road or, um, you know, was being attacked by a magpie or accidentally trod on it. Not that you should really put that on either. Or in the case of me, if I catch things on a survey that are non-target species, I just say, you know, was caught accidentally during approved research because, again, people should know there are really tight rules on interacting with wildlife. You shouldn't be handling wildlife because it breaches the law, every, even though I'm sure almost everyone does who's a hurt person. Um, but, you know, you want to avoid, I guess, those photos of yourself holding animals online because it can, in some circumstances, come back to bite you if you piss someone off. So, um, yeah, it's just good if you are working on an approved protocol, making that note. Um but one of the funniest ones I ever saw actually was a snake catcher who was just a relatively new snake catcher um, who had a photo of themselves. Oh, I think they were relatively new. They might not have been. Had a photo of themselves holding an Eastern Brown. And at the end, uh, they you know had this elaborate little snaky style story. You know how the snake catchers love an elaborate sort of story. And it finished with, and then they whispered in to his ear, my wildlife relocation permit number. <laughs> 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 um, 
uh, just in case anyone wanted to have a crack. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, it's just I've tangented it a little there, but it's, it's good to have the app, take the photo, upload it when you yeah. get back to reception. If you're in somewhere like an urban centre, you're going to have reception. Um, you can include those pieces of information and go, okay, cool, DOR. You can say it's an adult. You can, you know, if you it's a gravid female, you can tag it as female. If it's visually sexable, like, you know, if it's something that's like, say, a death adder where it's very clearly male or female at maturity, you can say it's male or female. Just all these sort of things that help people out. And then the next thing with INET that makes it quite cool is that there's what are called projects going on. So one of the examples was after the bushfires, there was an INAT project that was targeting areas of bushfire. And so if you took a photo of a species of any sort, whether it be a plant, an animal, like a, a, a mammal, an insect, a, a snake, a whatever, take a photo of it in an area that had been hit by bushfire and you added it to this project, it would then ask you a bunch of questions with that, that photo. So it would be like, have a look at the nearest trees. How high up are the burn marks on the nearest trees? Is there much canopy left on these trees? You know, blah, blah, blah. And so these projects are really useful tools to help people, and by people I mean researchers who are working on these sorts of questions, rapidly accumulate information. So in the case of the, the bushfires, this information was rapidly accumulated by people that were in areas after the bushfires, whether they be researchers, you know, people just going for bushwalks once parks open back up, but they helped to sort of rapidly fill in the gaps because the spatial extent of those fires was massive, right? Like mm. we all know that like half the East Coast was on fire. Um, but it meant that we could start asking all these broad questions and see what was turning up and rapidly get this information in. Um, another one that's quite huge, which is something I'm sort of hoping to jump into a bit later with some stuff I'm doing, is actually roadkill. So using um, iNaturalist photos and iNaturalist information at looking at roadkill. So going, okay... We've got all these photos because, you know, and this is the value of taking a photo of a DOR animal, right? Like, A, it's a presence yeah. record of the animal being in the area, but B, we can start to identify, you know, not necessarily regions where um, uh, things are getting hit more often. It's a bit harder to do without some sort of standardisation. But we can start to identify, you know, broad-scale um, implications of this... Oops, sorry, just stuck something on my desk. Um, these broad-scale sort of patterns of... Um, you know, what species or what traits in species are more predisposed to getting hit by cars using citizen science data. And it does have its limitations, as I said earlier, but it starts to help us ask these much more nuanced questions with a lot more data. And that's the benefit, right? Like, mm, exactly. for research, this stuff, doing research is expensive. You know, if you're going to drive out and go survey the same road a million times, you've got the time of the research to go out there, this is for roadkill, for instance. You've got the time of the research to go out there. You've got the fuel and mileage cost. Um, you know, you've got, if you need expertise to ID, not that that's the case, but, you know, you've got all these additional costs that add up and you need to repeat it. So science isn't a singular thing, right? Like it's very hard, yeah. if impossible, to get a paper published on what we call N of 1, so a replicate of 1. You need replication and, you know, stronger evidence that it's not just an oddity you need to prove that it's actually a pattern or there's support behind what you're saying, not that you've just found a one-off. A one-off tells you it can happen, but it doesn't tell you how common it is, if it's related to what you're looking at. You know, so we want this replication. And citizen science helps us get this, this huge spatial, this huge temporal replication for a relatively cheap amount of money because people are going out and herping or bushwalking or doing whatever anyway. So, you know, I guess that's my pitch is like, if you're going out and doing it, just take a photo. Like, you know, it's as simple as it is. I And that's what I do for 90% of my herping now. I can't even be bothered taking my camera. I literally, I went herping out west on the long weekend and I took my camera and it sat in the camera bag the whole time and everything I found, I just took a photo and put on line app. And that was more than enough for me. You know, they're all species I've seen before. Um, one of them was kind of cool because it was probably well on the tail end of them being out, which was a dear old noted in. So we've got to know yeah. now. Um, That's bad. But, you know, there'd been some heavy rain that day, so maybe it brought out the, the critter. But um, I know someone else that was out in that area found a heap of dead grey snakes. Um, oh. So they were all Gosh. out to the rain. But, you know, that's the sort of thing, right? Like if we see this big influx of animals after rain, it could, and, you know, you can look at the citizen science data, you can look at the, the climate data from the area and go, oh, look, there's this big influx of, snakes that have come out after the rain. Maybe they're eating for I don't know. That's a really shit example, but you get the point. Um, so, yeah. 
I suppose, um, like, in a sense, though, like, herpers are generally almost like most herpers are, are kind of like a seasonal type thing too. So that's only going to yeah. give you kind of like a window from generally spring to autumn sort of thing. It's not like herpers are going out over winter unless they're flipping yeah. or, or doing something like that. But I mean, and that's that's a limitation, right? The seasonality is a huge thing. And, like, if you look yeah. at all that data, every all data, like all of the, the reptile data, um, if you look at the seasonality aspect, you're absolutely right. 90% of it's found in um, that sort of active season. So, like, you know, very early autumn. Well, no, sorry, very, you know, spring through to, like, very early autumn is kind of when most mm. of it happens. But certain things are, like, depending on the biology, you know, winter breeding frogs are usually detected more in winter because they're calling. So they start yeah, yeah. giving away and, you know, that's when people find them more because, you know, they're harder to find outside of that period because might, as some people say, be little mud monsters that live in the mud and leaf litter and only make themselves dreadfully apparent when, um, you know, they're calling um, other, other than trapping or things like that. Um, and, you know, in the case of frogs, again, whenever you hear them, it's good to record them calling. So Frog ID did this excellent sort of paper that highlighted the fact that um, a hell of a lot of Australian frogs, more than we ever thought, actually called during the day. Like most of the mm. recordings that came through, you know, um, are at night, but there's a hell of a lot of them that spend a large proportion of their time calling during the day, and it's this sort of mm. implicit assumption that most frogs are calling during the night. Um, but they found like a much wider range of species, and there's certain things we know that do call in the day quite commonly, like Crinia signifera. You know, those little buggers are calling at all hours of all days of all months of all years. Like, hell couldn't tell those things just keep going. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, the, the, you know, we were able to go, wow, this is, you know, and that has bigger implications for people who want to do more targeted research on that sort of question, you know. Like, there's presumably a lot more costs calling at the day because females probably aren't going to run around as much. Like, you know, why would you you risk getting eaten by moving around? So, yeah, yeah. Um, but the other one that's quite useful as well and something that um, the AHS has been sort of facilitating and hopefully will we'll end up taking in a direction where it can get published um, is also looking at just photos of interactions. So there's this really great um, idea by a bunch of South African... Oh, I don't know if they were South... No, they might have been South African researchers. Definitely the, the question and the data was to do with South Africa. But they wanted to look at people that just take photos and upload them to Facebook going, what snake, what is this snake eating? And, you know, someone will ID the snake eating a blah, blah, blah. Um, and they went, wow, this is quite a rapid way to collect information on what things are eating if they've actually eaten them and developing our understanding of diets. Because in reality, a lot of the early snake research, so most of what we know about the fundamental ecology of snakes is all done by Rick Schein. There's a few other people or his students, his lab group, I should say wasn't yeah. solely done by him. There was definitely a lot of people that contributed, but Rick definitely did a lot of the foundational and definitely directed the work. Um, and so we've got all this fundamental information from um, when Rick basically went to museum collections, pulled out all these snakes, cut them up, ripped out their gut contents and went, okay, mustard belly snake is eating lizards. Devee's banded snake is eating frogs. Um, Eastern brown is eating anything. Um, you know, and he was able to sort of decide, like discern these, these dietary niches and figure out what these animals are actually eating, what species are being predated upon. And that's how he built this understanding. And, you know, that's basically how it's done around the world is that people look at museum specimens that have been collected and killed with food in the stomach and try and figure out what species. Another example from Australia is Pianca, Eric Pianca. He killed and he was not, not ashamed of this, but he caught and killed a hell of a lot of reptiles um, and the vast majority of them had things, or well, not the vast majority, but a lot of them had things in his gut, in their guts. Um, and he was able to tell us a lot about the diet of a lot of Australians, say, gamids and even things like gillens. And, you know, he's the one I, from memory that presented that cordolineatus do the, the gecko tail harvesting. You know, how they mm -hmm. supposedly go and eat gecko tails, but not whole geckos. But that was based on the fact that there's a lot of gecko tails in their gut, like their gut contents, but very few actual geckos. And when you consider the yeah. prey handling size, you know, Probably a bit hard for a, a quarter linearist to get a, a, a full size, you know, large gahara down. Um, so, which you know, they share the, the wood in the trees with. So he 
asserted that they might be doing this gecko tail harvesting farming sort of thing. Um, but that's how it was done historically. But what these South African guys did is they went, well, people are putting these photos of all these interactions up on Facebook, so why don't we start, you know, distilling them down into really useful information to understand these relationships? Because, you know, we, I'm sure you guys see it all the time. There are so many photos people put up of interesting things, and someone's like, wow, that's interesting. And you know what happens when it goes on Facebook? It fucking disappears. Exactly. That's the biggest <laughs> pain with Facebook. It just disappears. <laughs> Um, and, you know, Facebook groups um, are, are logged for, I think, 5,000 photos or something of 5,000 entries and then they start deleting them. So that will disappear down the line. A great example of one of the best observations ever was a goddamn whip snake eating a grape. And there's a video of the whip snake <laughs> eating a grape, you know. But these South African guys went, yeah, you know what? This is a great thing. And, you know, in a couple of years, I think it was 2016 or 2019 or something like that, it was over like two or three years. They accumulated, I think it was, you know, thousands. I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but thousands of new records of these these complex interactions between species. And they had information on if they actually ate them or not, if the prey escaped. Because that's the thing, right? Like, we only know successful prey capture from these sorts of things, but we don't necessarily know... Um, the misses. Always eating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And another good example, like, there's a paper that came out not long ago... Um, from some people I've worked with at UNSW who looked at geckos and tree sap. And so relatively few geckos other than like arboreal ones, people assume eat tree sap in Australia, like arid ones. Um, relatively few had sort of been picked as eating tree sap and mainly tropical. Um, and they ran this study out in Western New South Wales in like semi-arid country where they found even terrestrial geckos would climb up trees and eat tree sap. Hmm. Um and, you know, the reality is, is when you do gut content analysis, you don't see this sort of information because tree sap's just goop in the gut, right? But it's a high yeah. calorie, high sugar, you know, got lots of energy in it. So these geckos are definitely eating their little bits of tree sap. I, can't, I think it was like lucasium were climbing up trees and getting it. Mm-hmm. They obviously got to tell us we're eating it. Um, but, you know, when you actually sit and watch, you can start to see, wow, these are some odd things. Um, and so there's limitations on these museum studies. And it's not to say they're not good. They are good studies but there's limitations and this just helps fill the gap. And so that's what the AHS is trying to do. And we've seen like heaps, like, I mean, heaps of records. There's a really cool one today of someone who had um, uh, a slated gray snake up in Darwin eating their quail's eggs, you know, wow. like <laughs> just going in and it's like, oh, wow. And you know, there's all these interesting observations as well about like, and, you know, seeing how frequent it is and how widespread it is of domestic animals getting eaten by natives, you know, like, yeah. It's kind of history too, and it's definitely not something that's reported in, um, I guess, general literature. And maybe that propensity for certain species to more commonly eat domestic animals is, you know, not necessarily the reason why they do better in urban environments or these environments where humans are, but maybe that wider breadth niche or the ability to eat, like, say, a chicken or a quail or whatever. Or, you know, brown tree snakes, the number of brown tree snakes that eat people's budgies outside, huge. Mm. Um, no, there's all these questions that can sort of be start to be distilled as we get this resolution, as we get some more data. So yeah, it's one of those things where if you see a cool, cool observation of something interacting or you know something that's roadkill, upload it to one of these databases because it in the end will be useful. I'm definitely guilty of not doing this nearly enough, or if at all. Yeah. I think I've done a couple of frog doc, frog ID entries from memory, but yeah, the amount of stuff that I've seen, I, I should be doing it. No, totally. And like, it's not, I don't think it's something that people necessarily need to feel guilty about. I mean, there's maybe some people that, uh, you know, don't know about it, which is first off, you know, hopefully now you've got a bit of a better idea about it. Um, and like Frog ID is like such a good example. They have pumped, so, like iNaturalist Worldwide has pumped a lot out, but for a domestic project, Frog ID has accumulated so much data, like so much. They've run it really well. They've got people engaged, you know, like it's a really well run project. It's got so much data and they've got so many publications out of it. Like, you know, there's dozens of PhD or half a dozen PhD students that have all done work on Frog ID data because it's massive. They've got, like, I think it's over a million records now, like, in, what, four or five years. Like, when you consider that volume of knowledge compared to what it would have cost, like, the economic cost of someone to go out and survey that or a team to go out and survey that, like, it's a huge, huge benefit to, to everyone. And like you, you know, you recording something in that area might be useful down the line if it's a development project and someone goes, ah, oh, this 
threatened species isn't in this area, but if you've uploaded a high naturalist record and is in the area, bam, you know, like, yeah, might save them. Exactly. It'll at least contribute. I mean, that's that's probably a poor example because, you know, they'll probably still bulldoze it anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I've been out for ages yeah. and I've never actually used it, so I might actually start using it. Yeah, it's just, I, I'm, I love it. Like, I really, and, you know, it's funny, my partner's been a real reluctant sort to get on board with it. She frog ideas, obviously, because she's contractually obligated to. Yeah. Um, but... You know, she's always been pretty reluctant to use iNaturalist and I always on her. And then, yeah, when we did this last trip down to the Alps and, you know, she's like, oh, what's this? I was like, I have no clue. Throw it on iNaturalist and it started to build it. Build it. And now she's been iNaturalisting on her trips when she goes out on her own. Like, you know, there's there's heaps of, heaps of cool stuff you contribute. And, you know, as I said, even if you want to do it for a purely self, like self-serving sense, right, like, for me, yeah. as I said, it, it really helps me with my collector syndrome because I'm like, look at all the cool species I found. Or yeah, if right. someone asks me GPS where I found something, it's someone I want to give them information from, just go look at it on my iNAT. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's all logged there. It's all on the cloud. You don't have to worry about it. Um, you know, and it's not necessarily going to apply to everyone. Like if you're the type of herp, like, again, my interest in herping has moved to the point of, I like going to new areas and seeing what's in that area. Like, I don't necessarily yeah. want to go to it. Like, don't get me wrong. If I go to an area and I want to find the species there, I'll do that too. But part of the fun is finding all the species in that new area and recording them and going from there. If you go to the middle of nowhere, Arsene National Parks that no one really goes to, that's a great spot to do it. Like, you know, mm. uh, and there's an area I probably won't talk about on this because I know it's still a little hush-hush, but I know that a amateur herper found a pretty interesting species in the middle of nowhere, Arsene National Park, where it wasn't recorded from before, and it's quite well outside its range. You know, like, mm. these things happen. But, yeah. you know, if you're going to these parks, like, it's not to say that you'll find that example, but you might start to find, like, you know, extra limitable aspects of something's range. Like, for instance, Cyphos, there's some, some verified records of them out in some pretty weird regions. Like, you know, and... Cyphos, who cares about recording it? But it's not to say that they might not be on some more of these weird little mountain peaks at the weird extremes of their range, So, which are all national parks because, you know, you can't build a farm on a weird little mountain peak easily. So, uh, yeah. Oh, you've gone muted. That's really poorly phrased. Oh, there you go. I've got you again. Yeah, that's my fault. I hit the button on the microphone and forgot about it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's um, it's definitely put some stuff in pers- perspective, you know, because it's like I even think about one of my mates. Well, well, you know him as well, Simon, Simon Big. Yeah. You know, he's got a local track that he he loves walking and he loves going and checking up on his geckos and stuff like that. And he knows, like, you know, he's essentially named all the geckos on the track because he knows them that well because he walks there that often. But he's the kind of guy that's like that in tune with that particular track. So, you know, mm. any, any little thing that's out of place or something, he, he picks up on it and, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if he's onto iNaturalist or anything like that, but it'd be the kind of cool thing to, you know, just log data and he'd be able to be one of those people that knows the temps, knows the, you know, whatever sort of conditions for these animals to come out on. Yeah, and that's the thing, area. right? And if you, like, even, I mean, that's the thing of which I don't know if iNaturalist has it and it'd be interesting if it did, but I don't think it does, and it's probably pushing my knowledge of it. But even that absence, like if you're walking a track regularly, or again, the example I did with Frog ID, you go there regularly and know that that species is in that location and you're not getting it there, that is useful. Absence mm. data is, or like lack of present, like, you know, lack of it occurring there, if you know it's there, is actually quite powerful in, you know, ecology research, or quite useful, I should say. Um, mm. Because most stuff is biased with presence, right? Because when you find something there, you know it's there. But if you don't find it there, you don't know it's not there. You just know that it's either not there or you might not be finding it at that time. Like you yeah. just might not detect it. And so having the ability to go, okay, no, it's here, but we're not detecting it now or you know, is, is useful in some respects. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that's super. I've, I apologize to anyone that thinks I'm rambling. This has definitely been a bit more of one of my rambles, but... It's good. really, truly, if you can start to get in the habit of it, it's a really great thing to do. Um, yeah, yeah I think like that's, it, that's for sure. And it's the habit, right? Like, it's just a yeah. habit, you know? Like, I'm I'm shit at establishing sub-habits, 
But when you're driven to do what you do, but once you get in that, the role of doing things, it just becomes second nature. Like I crack out my phone, you know, and I record the photo of, you know, whatever. And it's not to say that like some people are, and I know some people that are like ridiculous eye natters where it's like, oh, this is the 58,000th fucking whatever we found today. I'll put it on nine out again. Don't need to do that. You can if you want, you know, in some circumstances it gets useful. But, you know, just take the first photo. If you find a cool-looking death adder that night, put a photo of a death adder on. If you find mm. a near-identical-looking death adder, probably not super useful. Find a baby death adder that night, like a real juvenile one, quite useful. You know, if someone wants to down the line look at reproduction or things like that, if you find a real neonate, you go, okay, this is pretty evidently a real neonate, so maybe this year they dropped around now, you know? like, mm. And it can give you a loose idea about, you know, breeding times and how that might shift through time if you've got this replication. There are certain roads that herpes just do to fucking death. You know, there's one yeah. in Karingai that everyone knows about. There's one on the mid-north coast everyone knows about. There's one on the central coast everyone knows about. There's one in yeah. Heathcote National Park everyone knows about. Like, you know, if people started doing cumulative records through these regions that we hit all the fucking time, it could be quite useful for, like, a look through time. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Especially if you put on, like, some of your records see. as well, like, your sampling effort. Like, if you go... Uh, found this tonight, like even if it's just a comment, but, you know, we started at 8 p.m. and found X, Y, Z tonight through the, yep. I don't know, 6 p.m. And it might not be useful now, but maybe they will bring in a feature or something like that that is, you know, able to take into account that sampling effort. Mm. But, you know, it's good to know the night's been, might help us, you might, this sort of widespread data might help people if we have some sort of sampling effort, figure out what times are best to target looking for certain species, you know, when is it easier to detect certain things because... The benefit of citizen science, as I've said so many times tonight, is the scale. It's a yeah. it's dirty data. It's dirty. Think about it. dirty, dirty. But it's huge, and that's mm. a benefit. And it's a trade-off you've just got to accept. So take a photo of everything. Upload it. If you want to know what it is, take a photo of it. Um, you know, if it's dead, if it's been killed by a bird, if it's been killed by a car, take a photo of it. Um, yeah. yeah. If a snake you were not handling because you're not supposed to regurgitate something, take a photo of it and say you saw the snake regurgitating it. Like, <laughs> it's all just useful information. Yeah. Well, I think that might become my um, my thing to do because, you know, I'm, I quite often go out with people and they're just constantly using cameras and stuff like that and, you know, that's their, that's their jam or whatever. I usually just stand there like a goof and look at an animal just admiring it. But maybe I should make a, make a little note and... And I might actually download the app now just to yeah, just start, start making notes of it. Yeah. yeah, and it's cool seeing like even, and, you know, I, I don't know the examples off the top of my head, but I'm sure you can start doing some fine scale stuff looking at like, um, and this is, you got to think, it's like um, superannuation. This is a weird example, but I think it'll make the point quite well, right? <laughs> like you put your superannuation in early and you build it up as you go, but the whole point of it is is that it compounds through time and you get this really fucking hopefully neat amount of money when you decide to retire. But it's about slow incremental increases. INAT's still in its infancy, you know, relatively speaking. Through yeah. time, if you get in the habit now and everyone starts contributing and it's growing and we all know it's growing, we can start to fill in these gaps. And certainly, you know, if you're going to a region or if you're going to um, whatever that national park is in like the NTSA border, like you know, towards Inaminka or whatever, you know, yeah. if you're recording stuff out there, that's quite interesting, you know, like, because there's not many records out there. Um, if you're doing the Canning Stock Route, you know, take records along there. If you're in Mitchell River, certainly it's been done a lot for targeted research, but you can get good data there. So, yeah. yeah. If your colour, if you get a, a good photo of something with a weird colour morph, it's so useful for people. Like, I know people that work on... Um, you know, colour morph lizards, so, like, you know, species with different colour morphs, like Tenophorus pictus, for example, um, knowing where those populations are, not that they do have within population variation, but knowing where some of these colour morphs are are useful for people working on them. Um, even using that data, if there's enough of it, you know, comparing colour morphs at a landscape level and the prevalence of them, um, colour is a huge thing. So if you can get a good photo with the animal's colour and pattern and discernible features, people can do these big things, like I mentioned with... Um, uh, Jules Farquhar's paper on the Lacey's. So, yeah. So, yes, I'm glad that I've hopefully tried to convince you, Luke. Uh, well, I, I have convinced you, I think. I hope I have. You have. Um, I'm literally just... downloading it right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually um, just like, yeah, and I'm to... have a download of it. I've just never used it. 
But it's like, well, you know, it's really fun. Like I don't know. I, let me. I'll bring it up on my phone now. If we're all going to sit on our phone now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, you know, especially me working in the bush and you know playing around with a few skinks that are you know common as everything out in the bush or whatever like that. Like it's you know it'll be cool. Cool. Yeah, just doing my, my, my smokos or whatever and make notes of things. And like even common things like you know I one of the ones I took recently which was just semi useful like invasives can be useful if they're in weird parts of the range you know like if you're you know in a the instance of my one that I took recently was of a gambusia so I was at a weird little creek where gam- gambusia hadn't been recorded before and I took a photo and you know in this this pond of this creek or this you know this whatever the the big deep part there's a bunch of gambusia and it was like okay well there's a record of gambusia that's obviously been translocated or moved or whatever, but now it's here. Um, mm. So, like, they, they, they accrue. Like, it's useful if even common things. Like, I know it's a bit of a piss-weak argument saying, take the data, but we don't know what we'll use it for, but one day it could be quite useful. Um, and, again, again, just think about, it, like, compounding interest. Through time, you know, it will accrue. Yeah. It'll be huge, you know. Yeah, for sure. And one else sort of the final one, I guess, sort of finish on, and – this one's a bit more shaky as with respect to people contributing. And I know there's very distinct rules. I want to start off with that first. So it's very state by state and there's really tight legislation, but pending what the rules are. And I know in New South Wales, there's a bit of a look into what's happening with this at the moment. Um, technically at the moment though, I won't recommend anyone doing it, but keep up to date, especially if you're a herper who likes to contribute. Um, but particularly roadkill, especially of snakes, can be quite useful. So talking about the olden days of museums where everything was a bit more rough and tumble, you know, um, it was really common for snakes just to be preserved in formalin. And, well, not just straight formalin, but preserved using formalin. And formalin destroys usable DNA. Like, it, it makes them pretty useless um, for most methods. Um, and so what this has led to for a bunch of really... I wouldn't necessarily say common species, but things that are widespread and, you know, not really collected or looked at, um, we have a real lack of DNA. And that's why people still do studies where they go out to whoopity whoop to go collect tissue from animals. And, you know, it's a huge cost to go on a trip to go collect tissue for animals. And in this day and age, DNA is a huge, I mean, like a huge tool used in determining whether something's a species, whether populations are, you know, genetically distinct and warrant you know, extra conservation measure and things like that. Um, and so pending how things go in your respective states, and I know Queensland is probably the tightest, um, there may be provisions for hurt people when they find roadkill to collect it and preserve it. And there's probably, you know, requirement of proof of, you know, this is, is definitely roadkill, I didn't kill it myself, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not saying you should do this now, but just keep your ear to the ground for it. Because the amount of roadkill people come across and just toss, if you've come across something that's real fresh roadkill, that DNA could be quite useful, you know. If it's a good specimen, like I, I got a brown snake that I, you know, on a trip with my partner and it ended up going to the museum and even a, um, a copperhead, you know. But I got a brown snake that got hit in just behind the neck and its head was fine, its neck was fucked and its rest of its body was good. It's a good, good size specimen brown snake. But it made a really useful specimen at the museum. And similarly, on some work we were on doing surveying, we found a copperhead that was roadkill. Uh, roadkill, sorry. And inside its gut was a she-oak skink, you know, two for oh, one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we knew that the copperhead had been eating she-oaks up there, which is a useful bit of information. Um, but we also knew that um, we got tissue from the she-oak because it wasn't fully trashed. So there was a DNA sample for she-oaks in the region as well, um, as well as tissue and a specimen from the, the copperhead. Um, yeah, sure. So there's plenty of ways that people can contribute, and especially for snakes, uh, because they, you know, some snakes are easy to sample in large numbers, but generally speaking, they're these ephemeral things that pop up from time to time. Now, it's not like you go to your backyard and you see 10,000 delicata and you know that you're going to get a good lot of tissue from your backyard. Not that people do, but you get the point there's a high density of them there. While snakes mm-hmm. are a lot more ephemeral, you know, they pop up from time to time. Um so it's really useful when we have these resources. As I said, and I'm going to finally reiterate again, though, all this sort of talk is in its infancy, but it'll be really great because, again, people are going out, collecting, you know, seeing these animals, finding this roadkill all the time, having it there and being able to actually contribute to these studies will be huge. 
And there will be checks and balances whenever any formal statement comes out or any formal way to do this because they don't want people rotting the system. But hopefully it'll be a great way that Herpes can contribute because even, you know, things that you would consider in common or things that people wouldn't give a shit about, even just like, you know, if it's dead on the road, you take some of its tissue and preserve it appropriately and it can be used for a DNA study, it's a really useful thing. But again, not saying you should do that at the moment because it's still a grey area and certainly you don't want to get yourself in trouble. But it's a fun thing that people can look forward, hopefully, to doing because it is a great way to contribute. Fingers crossed. Yeah, hopefully that pulls through. And particularly in Queensland, I know you're just really not supposed to do it. People get done for carrying roadkill, I've been told, so don't do it in Queensland. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyway, thank you, oh, everyone, for listening to my long rant of opinions about the wonderful world of citizen science and how you can contribute. Mm-hmm. Hopefully but, I sold you. Uh, I might not have some points, but hopefully overall I've sold you. No, so, I'm sure, you know, simple. even if you do get a whole handful of people on, you know, it's for good reasons at the end of the day, so. Yeah, that's right. Just the extra couple of people, so, you know, worth a lot more than no extra people. Yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. Um, so I was just, I guess as a, I've kind of finished my spiel on it, I think the final points I'd sort of say, like, so anyone, I know you've probably got a global audience, right? Like there's probably Americans and pommies and stuff that jump on. So, yeah. and even like those guys, like if you're overseas and jumping around and going to different countries and helping different countries, you can still INAP from other countries. It's not like, oh, I'm Australian or, oh, I'm British or, oh, I'm US. I can't INAP. Now, if you're going yeah. to these different places, put put records up at those different places. You know, my trip to New Zealand, I saw like, I don't know, fuck all when I went there, but I put the photos up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, well, I didn't, I saw more than that, but I, I didn't take photos of it because I was having a holiday. <laughs> um, but, you know, put photos up. So you've got INAT, which is global. So that works all, all across the world. Um, you've got Hurt Mapper, which is also global. And if you're particularly yeah. concerned about, um, you know, people getting up to no good, you can upload your records to Hurt Mapper. Um, but, you know, I, I'm more of a, I'm an INAT true and true, as you probably gathered. Um, frog ID is another good one. So frog ID is specifically for frogs and frogs calling. So if you find a frog moving and you get a photo, or like bopping across the road or whatever, and you take a photo of it, upload that to INAT. But if you hear frogs calling, upload it to frog ID. Um, for each of these, these apps, programs, whatever, there's really good resources, you know, on how to use them and what to do. And they're all very intuitive. Like they're designed to be as friendly as possible to get as many people involved. Um, and then the other ones I mentioned were the Facebook groups, um, where it's sort of like, again, this is the dirtiest of the data. We're not collecting location. We're not collecting information where, oh, sorry, we're not collecting location data. We're not collecting, you know, fine scale information. We're just getting these observations of what's actually occurring. And so one of those is the, um, uh, predators and prey of Australia, I think it's called, I can't remember the exact name off the top of my head, but you can also see some really crazy observations of things there, you know? Like really yeah, crazy interactions and like people have put full videos of, you know, a Eastern Brown trying to kill and eat a land mullet, you know, or the hmm. hopefully that slady grey snake one eating the um uh ch- 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 eggs has right. gone there. Something I've noticed from that page is how many things in the N T eat swampland lash tails? Those lizards have a rough bloody life. Everything is eating them. <laughs> um <laughs> I guess where every third record is like, ah, oh, tree snake eating swampland lash tail, brown eating swampland lash tail, everything eating swampland lash, lash tail. Um, you know, which probably is important. It indicates they're a very common prey source for a whole heap of species up there. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, those groups exist too, and it'd be worth checking them out. Um, so yeah, other than that, I think that's that's the end of me. Pass back to you guys. You got, do you have any questions? I realized I rabbited for like an hour there. So. No, that was awesome. That's good. No, it was fantastic. You know, I mean, you've always been such a great speaker, so that's why you're always welcome back when you've got a bright idea that pops into your head. So <laughs> it's um, it was definitely worthwhile having you back on because I, I feel like Jason and I got to just sit back and get educated, to be honest. Yeah, so. no, it was awesome. I'm definitely going to start using that app a lot like more now, for sure. Yeah, and it's like... Tomorrow, so let's see anything. It's, it's great to, you know, and even if you guys spread it to one more extra person, like, you know, if that's the thing, right, you go out herping with multiple people, you take a photo and put it on, it all starts to sort of spread by mouth as well, right? Like, this is one example, yeah. but, like, and, you know, not everyone will do it. People will just go, I don't give a shit, you know, and it's fine. Like, if you don't, cool, I don't, 
<laughs> I was going to say really mean. I was going to be like, I don't want to waste breath on you. It's fine. It's really not the end of the world. But if you're willing to do it, it's a great way to contribute. Yeah, exactly. Might as well give something back for your time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we might wrap this up because I've got to go to bed. I'm mm, really, really tired. <laughs> but, you know, thanks so much for coming on, dude. And, you know, you're always Definitely. welcome back on. I think that was an absolute awesome topic tonight. So thanks for uh, for putting it out there. I think that was fantastic. Um, guys, we'd like to say a massive thank you to Eric and Owen and the rest of the NPR crew for having us. If you'd like to contact them, it's best to find them at moreliapythonradio.com and email them at info at moreliapythonradio.com. Make sure to follow the NPR network on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. As far as contacting us on our social media platforms, you can email us at australianherptoculture at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as well. To see more of what Jason is doing, make sure to follow him on Facebook and Instagram at The Gecko Effect. And for myself, you can find me on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, and Teespring under Beast and Scary Beast. Maybe I'll be back next week for another episode of the Australian Herptoculture Podcast. Good night, everyone.